apparently this is the comedy slab. We do actually put a comedy, a different comedy each week, be it TV, radio, podcast, whatever, onto the notional slab of comedy to prod it about a bit, see uh, who salutes, whether we like it, what we make of it, and give it uh, a score out of five each. You are welcome to play along, of course, and indeed to suggest uh, future comedy shows that we could prod similarly. Uh, So we hope you enjoy the ride. You may have noticed the show in question, what we are putting on the slab this week is Ronnie Barker's, it's a radio show, Ronnie Barker's Lines from My Grandfather's Forehead. And it's one of those occasions where, well, actually to the year this time, I don't know if we've managed it before, it's actually a half a century since this show went out for the first time. Um, If we're absolutely precise, it actually happens to be the episode title or the way they've catalogued it. I don't think it would have been the original episode title, but it's actually called... Uh, the 15th of the 3rd, 71. In other words, of course, uh, it went out on, well, one assumes, uh, 15th of March, 1971, 50 years ago. <gasps> anyway, um, when I put this on the slob, this is a slob, the slab. <laughs> Sorry, I was looking at Shane. No, yeah, I'm joking. <laughs> I, um, I, when I chose this, and it's, uh, uh, I actually heard it randomly on BBC Radio 4 Extra, the archive sister or brother to BBC Radio 4, the speech station of which it has been said. But um, when I suggested it to you, Shane, uh, Mm. as we do this each week, uh, what was the kind of anticipation uh, level for you and pleasant or otherwise? Well, yeah, I I would say pleasant anticipation, Mm. although it was one of those that um, I kind of get, every time it, it wheels into view... I kind of get frustrated by it because I really want to know. I can't. Re- I can never find out what the story is behind it, how it came about, what happened, who commissioned it, why they commissioned it. Mm. W- was it Barker's idea? Um, did he have stuff already? You know, what was the whole? What was he trying to achieve? I, you can't really find an awful lot written about it. It's almost like one of those that fell down the cracks in the in the floorboards, didn't it? Really. Um, mm. So that, that's the only major frustration is that I always kind of think. Yeah, but what was this? Does anybody know what the story is? Well, there's an invitation. Um, do get in touch with us. Uh, I'll give you the um, anti-social media details a bit later on. Um, I actually have a tome which I looked at. Uh, my sister was downsizing and got rid of some of her comedy books in my direction. So that oh. um, that was very nice. And one of those is Ronnie Barker's Everything I Ever Wrote. And then, um, I'll be honest, I haven't got that far into it, but in the introduction it says, actually, this is a misnomer because it's not everything I ever wrote. Some of it is lost, sadly. But it does include, and it's not from this episode because I had a little leaf through it, but it does include some sketches from uh, lines from my grandfather's forehead. Um, Here's the thing I've got to ask you as well, is that because you're a a Unitarian where it comes to (laughs) um, comedy sitcoms, when when you get a book, do you just read one chapter? (laughs) <laughs> uh, well, I, um, I suppose the closest analogy is I only read one book of that author. I know you're being slightly mischievous, but <laughs> I'm not proud of it. But to the, this day, I've only read one Charles Dickens book. I live in Charles Dickens country kind of thing. Mm. And uh, I'm not proud of that at all because, you know, th- without uh, question, if people list, you know, the most important writers, you know, going for, for across all time, in the English language, um, for I, I admit, obviously not everyone, but for a lot of people and people I respect, you know, he's up there with the greats. And the uh, great being the word, great expectations. I had to read for O level, <laughs> so it, it even took you know some kind of heavy nudging from my English teacher to get me to read it. But that's a sign of how long ago it is since I wrote one. It must be due a, a second one though, since I read one, I should say. I was trying to think of the famous quotes from the. Um... Um, the Monty Python sketch in the bookshop was it? Was, mm. was it? Was it Barnaby oh, Rudge? But D- Dickens with two Ks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that rings a bell. Yeah, I can't remember the detail, but you you probably remember it far better. Oh, I loved it. I've got to look that one up on YouTube now because it's just a, it's a real cracker, isn't it? It's like whatever, it is. whatever he suggests. He's going no, no, not that version. <laughs> not not that. It's something else I wanted. Yeah. Anyway. Um, Although this is the main subject of the show, it's actually a digression when we should be talking about comedy news. And you've come up with, a, I think, a corker, a really interesting new project. 
do tell. Well, yeah. Uh, can I just mention as well, the one thing that winds me up is people who go to the effort of writing some great comedy mm. and then just call it episode three. Because to me, that's the that's the best bit is the, what are we going to call this episode <laughs> and like a clever play on words or something, you know, or or... Mm. I don't know, or even the line from it or something. So people go, ah, that's why they called that episode that. But to to call it like the 15th of March, 1971. Well, I, yes. I, um, again, you're being mischievous. I very much doubt Mr. Barquet, as I can't help calling him, thanks to Bo Selector, ah. um, actually gave it that title. But, but, hey. but he, this, this has been renamed by somebody at the BBC, presumably, <laughs> in the absence of him writing a title for it. So he's only got himself do, do to we know that, Or do we know that for a fact? Well, before we get on our high uh, horses. Well, they would have used that, wouldn't they? Surely. Wait, they you, they would have, don't think so. surely. Yeah. <laughs> well, otherwise they could have gone... I mean, actually, I would have... I would have gone with uh, an episode number. That would have made more sense. At least you know the sequence. Yeah, the, the, yeah, the, but, the, the sequence, yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah. I'm sorry, that's yet another thing you've got upset about. But uh, more importantly... I've, I've, it's all it is. I've bought myself a batch of new green biros, and uh, I've got nobody to write to, so I'm just uh, I'm just <laughs> venting, venting my various spleens. Uh, yeah, no, I saw Brendan O'Carroll was uh, preparing to make a new comedy. Brendan O'Carroll, of course, he of Mrs. Brown's Boys, mm. uh, he created that, and um, I should say alongside uh, Danny O'Carroll and, and Paddy Paddy Houlihan. Um, but he's. It was just, it was the headline that struck me because he said, Brendan O'Carroll preparing to make BBC army sitcom Lebanese Outpost. And I thought, well, that's a bit random, isn't it? Um, just a bit. And, and I mean, I, I did look actually, and I actually put into Google when were the Irish in the Lebanon because I didn't realise they were. And apparently mm. they were between 1978 and 2001. I had no idea. Although, interestingly enough, an uncle of mine was a police officer in um, Israel for some reason, after he left the Irish army. Um, so wow. I don't know whether it's a kind of a Middle East Irish connection that goes on. But I just thought, what a random thing to write about. Mm. But in a way, uh, that's part of his charm, I guess. And, and part of the challenge for uh, him writing it is is to, well, to take us into that world, which... Uh, I feel less ashamed not knowing that uh, you know there were Irish forces uh, in the Lebanon. Uh, since you've got Irish roots, I think well, if you didn't know, can you see? And, um, yeah. yeah, sorry uh, about that. I've got, to die. I've got to die. That it's a bit. Late. You do that every time. I know. And I, I thought you might let it rest, but you wouldn't let it lie, would you? Well, I just thought I the, let it lie. the idea as well that I've got absolutely well, not absolutely no hair, but very very little hair, it kind of makes it even more, you know. Um, uh, hilarious, but obviously not. <laughs> um, and I just, I just, I mean, is that the most bizarre premise for a sitcom you've ever heard? Although, I'll, I'll be honest, I did a little bit of research, and it's an American series, and I've seen an episode of it. There was mm. a sitcom in America called My Mother the Car. Have you seen that? No. Where An intriguing title. I'm pretty certain that Clive James champion this when he was doing his programs about tv around the world my mother the car is about a guy whose mother dies mm. and she she her, her spirit inhabits an old vintage car that's weird that's a bit like christine isn't it yeah a haunted car but i mean who commissioned that i mean you've got to be smoking the doobie fags haven't you <laughs> to, to, to go oh that's a great idea let's do this unless it's the last thing you do and you've already got a job lined up or you're on gardening leave after that. Yeah, and you think, oh, I really want to leave him with a real doozy here. <laughs> um, and could you translate, for those of us not familiar with the term? The, the old doozy, it's a right old cracker. Right. Um, but yeah, I just, I just, I, I, it got me on that train of thought, how important is the, the sit in sitcom? Mm. And, you know, very often people get criticised for, oh, this is another, this is another family sitcom. Mm. Or it's another this, or it's another that, and I just think, is it? Does it? Does it? It's uh, to me, maybe it's the characterisation that matters. It's the characters that matter more than the sitcom, the, the situation. Well, uh, yeah, one would say that normally. I nearly corrected you the other week when we were talking about uh, the sit in sitcom. Nearly, 
because nearly, yeah, it, it takes something to bite my tongue not to correct not like you. Not here at all, is it? Really? I know, I know. It's a missed opportunity, I think, and I'm beating myself up. But here it is, uh, you know, on on a gift wrapped plate again, and I'm actually taking it. Right. Well, uh, we'll look out for it, and do look out for the article, dear listener. You'll find it in the British Comedy Guide. The URL for which is comedy.co.uk. So, to the show in question, the show we're going to put on the slab. Uh, so, Ronnie Barker's Lines from My Grandfather's Forehead. Um, it's a bit of a gag in the title, I guess. Um, I was just trying to mug up on um, Ronnie Barker's illustrious career earlier, mm. and uh, I ran out of time, which is a measure of... <laughs> yeah. OK, uh, bad planning on my part, which is situation normal, but also a measure of just how much he did. I mean, I was reading that... By the time he got to being in West End um, uh, th- uh, plays, it would have been, he'd already appeared in 300 plays, um, which is something that it, that would have been in, mostly in rep, I would have thought. Mm-hmm. Um, what, what do you make? Because uh, you're a bit of a delver into the, um, the CV of uh, the people we tend to put on the slab. Any, any thoughts on anything you've dug up? <laughs> No, only that it was quite interesting towards the end is that, that he'd kind of had enough and he went into antiques, didn't he? Um, yeah. Which maybe, maybe you know, he was spent by the time um, that that came around and he thought, well, I just want to, I just want to get away from it all. I know that the new guard um, upset him greatly. I, I know, do you remember not the nine o'clock news did a sketch? Oh, and he, he wasn't amused, whereas I think Corbett was. Yeah, uh, yeah. and... And it, it, they were basically saying it was all bum titty jokes, um, and they did Mel Smith and Griff Rhys Jones did a did a, a, a song, didn't they, in the style of Barker and Corbett, <laughs> which I find funny. You just you mentioning it, yeah. So I, I'm in the Ronnie uh, Corbett camp rather than Ronnie Barker. But he was really upset by it, wasn't he? He was really, he yeah. Said, you know, there was so much more to us than that, and it, and and you know, I think I think that was like i said to you at the time you know that was the time when comedians thought it was a good idea to do that um and to um and to attack the uh, the old guard but mm. but yeah i know, I know that upset him. i don't know whether that hastened his uh, his departure to uh, to antiques i'm not really quite sure well i read uh, I, I seem to remember from around the time even that um he looked around and and saw that a lot of comedians had died young. Um, I mean, you know, what you consider young is is all relative, and certainly it's very much uh, coloured, perhaps, by how old you are yourself. And mm. You look around and you think, you know, I I, I want to, um, you know, enjoy a a long life. And uh, I mean, it was certainly said of uh, double acts, and I suppose perhaps particularly Eric and Ernie. Uh, more common wise to our younger listeners, Google it. Um, that you know, you know, it's it's tougher on on the funny man because he's he's got to work ten times harder, arguably, than than the uh, the straight guy. Mm. Um, you know, again, how do you, how do you quantify that? But um, uh, you know, even when uh, Eric Morecambe was emerging from hospital, having had another heart operation, he was he was doing the jokes for the press. Yeah. And, and now that's pressure he's putting on himself, but it's also sort of um, expectations of your audience as well. Although I do wonder whether a lot of that was his personality. I think, you know, there wasn't, there wasn't a great divide bet- between um, Eric Morecambe, the private man, and Eric Morecambe on stage, was there? I mean, they were, they, you know, there, there was a lot of him in the act, wasn't there? I think so. I mean, I had uh, a, a former BBC colleague who lived in Harpenden, which is where um, Eric lived for, well, certainly once his career really took off. And uh, uh, my colleague bumped into him three times, as a child, bumped into him three times that day. And and that became the joke and a, a running gag by Eric. And every time, each of the three times, he had another joke for him. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that so that suggests uh, it's very much him and what he wanted to project. Anyway, um, back to Mr. Barker. I think we should hear the first of uh, two audio clips just to give you a taste of uh, what the material's like. Mm. And uh, it is a sketch show. Um, and we joined this sketch pretty much near the top, so you get a, a good uh, scene setter. And um, perhaps it's no co- coincidence that we are, given where Ronnie semi-retired to, or at least changed gear in, uh, in career terms, uh, this is set in an antiques shop, would you believe? Hello? Hello? 
Anyone in? Uh, oh, oh! if you've come about the rates, I've just sent a check, and if it hasn't reached you, it's got lost in the post. Oh, no, I just wanted to ask you... I know nothing about the telephone bill. I never got it, nor the reminder. Uh, you must have sent it to the wrong address. I want to know how much that little tarnished teaspoon is, the one in the corner of the window. What? Oh, oh, you want to buy something? Oh, this is wonderful. You are my first customer. This morning? This year. Still, mustn't despair. It's only February, isn't it? Come in, come in. Sit down. Put your feet up on this pile of gramophone records. I'll just move the car. Shoo! Uh, no, no, no please don't bother. I just want to see the teaspoon. Oh, this one, is it? Oh, must be your lucky day. Isn't it beautiful? It's Georgia, that. Uh, just wants a, just wants a bit of a polish. That's all. How much is it? Uh, well, I'll make you a special reduction because I know, I know it's your lucky day. Thirty pounds. What? Well, uh, twelve pounds ten. Then. Twelve pounds ten? Oh, that's ridiculous. Well, all right, uh, four pounds. Oh no, I'm sorry. Thirty bob. Was it my imagination, or did his accent settle somewhere between Cardiff and Bangalore? <laughs> I thought you were going to say Bangor. Um, <laughs> That's a little um, harsh, uh, except uh, for viewers in Wales um, or <laughs> listeners. Um, so we've got to have your headline. Putting that to one side, I'm refusing to be um, tempted by that question. Um, my headline, uh, pure and simple, was all barker, no bite. Oh. I, I thought you were more of a fan. Well, I, oh. yeah, but I don't know what this is. I don't know what it is. I mean, it was nice to hear... Um, uh, uh, Pauline Yates there, who of course played Reggie's husband in. Um, I never know. I never always remember which way around. Is the fall Reg and rise? Right. I think it's rise. Anyway, no, we know what we're talking about. The Reggie Perry. Yeah, the fall series. and rise of Reggie Perry. Yeah. Um, she was his husband, uh, Pauline Yates, who played the lady in the shop there. Uh, yeah, I, I, I struggled with it. I really did. I, don't, I didn't. I don't think I laughed anywhere, which I was really shocked about. Mm. Um, because I was expecting to, but um, that's it even when I, you know I said to you at the start. I always, whenever I come across this, I want to know what the story is. Yeah, because it is so different from anything else he's done, and mm. because it doesn't make me laugh and because it's a bit weird and because it's a mishmash of strange things and because it's a really weird amalgam of writers who who wrote for it i i just it just perplexes me i mean it doesn't make me cross that it doesn't make me laugh but it just it just really confuses me what about you did you i mean did, did you enjoy it did it make you laugh i i enjoyed it and it's two separate questions no it didn't make me laugh but i didn't feel cheated i mean i I suppose I approached it a bit more as a sort of social history, mm. um, however odd that might sound. And so, I mean, I think you might have given something away in terms of that you, you, you were expecting to laugh. And, and part of the mix of comedy and how we receive it is expectations, isn't it? Um, but I've got this theory that you could shoot me down in flames, but I've got a theory that this might just have been a hint at uh, or even a, a forerunner of the smile com, as I call comedy dramas or sitcoms without too much com or certainly without big uh, cackly laughs. Mm. Um, and that of itself isn't a criticism. In fact, I think we'll hear that more clearly in the second of our two audio clips, so that'll be in a little while, um, where I don't think he's going for laughs. And, and maybe that's what's confusing you because there is, I don't know, you can tell me if, if I'm miles out here, but... I'm guessing, like me, you were expecting set up, set up, set up, development, bang, punchline, kind of shape to it. Well, if, even you, more so that? than that. I mean, I was waiting. For, I was waiting for a punchline mm. a lot of the time, and and it never came, did it? Well, there was one for that sketch. I mean, um, I didn't want to issue too many spoilers, but it is only a short sketch. Um, she ends up uh, buying the shop rather than. Uh, buying a teaspoon mm. that that is a, well that mm, it's not a punchline in the sense that it, it's a pithy phrase that of itself gets a laugh but it's an idea isn't it it's an idea com yeah <laughs> defining a new whole whole new genre i do wonder whether this was his first foray so this is this is how i look at it i mean i don't know if you're familiar with the series seven of one 
I know of it, but I've never seen it. So if you ever want to put it on the slab, I w- well, obviously being a Unitarian who only watches one episode of each series, I only want to see one of seven. But um, I'm up for it if you want to put it on the slab sometime. Well, it's a difficult one because it was basically, it was a series of seven pilots, mm. um, one of which was the pilot for Open All Hours, um, one, of, one of which was an episode called Prisoner and Escort, which became um, Porridge. Porridge. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the others didn't really there was an episode called My Old Man Spanners 11 about a football team another fine mess with Roy Castle where he played a Laurel and Hardy impersonator mm-hmm. uh, One Man's Meet with Prunella Scales and I'll Fly You for a Quid none of the others really were taken up or anything but I do wonder whether this was this was his radio This was in, that was in 73 7 of 1 yeah. and, and I wonder I kind of thinking well maybe is this is this, was this his first foray into you know Picking up loads of scraps of paper of ideas and characters and and, and um, uh, situations and putting it all together or making it into something else. Well, I, I could imagine that being in the mix of things, although I don't think it's obviously anything you would necessarily go public with. But um, I could I could see it being a calling card for him. Uh, hey, look at me! I can do different accents, uh, character actor. A comedy actor yeah. um, and you know we do have to factor in it is uh, 50 years old and uh, you know it, it it is of its time but I think if that was the aim then I, you know I, it's hard to see it as a failure but of course you want to enjoy a show as a show don't you mm. and as a as a, a work that uh, forgive the repetition of the word work uh, works in its own terms and um, yeah, it is. It is a bit of a mishmash. I certainly felt that, and I, I, I think that's why I chose this uh, the, the the second clip because I think it gives a bit of a contrast with that first sketch we heard in the antique shop. The the interesting thing is that um, you're right. Is that you know being fifty years old um, m- m- sort of you know puts it in a period in time. But the good the good news is for people, I suppose, is that to me. Radio doesn't always, I mean, it can do, but it doesn't always date as much as TV because you haven't got those visual references that make you go, oh, look at the hat or look at the car or mm. do you remember when nobody had a computer and a smartphone? You know what I mean? There's a lot of the stuff that doesn't actually bubble to the surface, does it, because it's radio? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Well, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I lean more towards audio than um, pickies. I was just going to say, I'm frustrated though, even to the point where I found myself thinking, I wonder if this went out on a Sunday lunchtime because it had a lot of space in it, didn't it? Do you feel it, it had a lot of room to breathe and a lot of space and it wasn't rushed at all, was it? No. Um, I'm just going to look up the uh, the date because you can do that, supposedly on modern computers. Let me, I'm just putting in 1971. No, I'm not, it's, it's not going to cope. Um might actually blow up my computer. It must have been a different diary. I was once putting an entry in for 11 o'clock in the morning once and all my many entries in my electronic diary suddenly disappeared and I panicked that I deleted my entire diary, which had been running already by then for a few years. Mm. And do you know what it turned out to be? It had gone to the year 1100 AD. Uh, (laughs) Who designs a computer that could do that? And realised that electric didn't exist. (laughs) Exactly. And had to spit itself off. (laughs) Yes, and um, it blew up. But mine can't cope. It's it's trying to go to the year 999, which is weird. Uh, I don't want to call the police in, in vain and get charged with wasting their time. Um, so anyway, I can't tell you what day the fifteenth uh, uh, of March was in nineteen seventy-one. Some right. clever person out there will, though. I'm quite sure. So, uh, are you ready for that clip then, or did you want to explore yeah, sure. any no, other ideas? No, let's have a look. I mean, hopefully, I mean, as you said, this this will be an interesting contrast and, and might might give a bit of a flavour to to how it was. It was a mishmash, wasn't it? To mm. to use a phrase. Yes, or light and shade, however you want to do it. Although uh, comedy usually, or, or of that era, and of uh, Ronnie Barker's sort of mainstream stuff, uh, was not normally light and shade, it was light and light. But, it, was, uh, it, it was a Monday, by the way, sorry, uh, 15th right. of March, 71. So that's my theory gone up, up the... <laughs> up, up the, the swanny. Up the wazoo. 
<laughs> OK. Well, um, hats off to you for finding that out, at least. Uh, you must have leafed through all those old pages uh, of your diary very I've, quickly. I've got a Gregorian uh, iPhone. That's what it is. <laughs> Don't get many of those to the book. No, not, not, not now. <laughs> right, OK, so this one, I'm, I'm, it's my contention, which you might feel free to shoot down, Shane, I'm sure you will, as with many of my uh, barking or barker ideas. Um, I think this might be the forerunner to the smile com, so it's not going for laughs. Uh, the very nature of it, I think, is quite, well, the, the subject matter is a bit sleepy, as you'll find out. Four o'clock... I just gotta get some sleep. Oh, singing helps, they say. Rule Britannia, Britannia rules our waves. Brit. No, that's the wrong sort of song, isn't it? That'll wake the neighbours anyway. Uh, try something else. Well, no. Um, oh, I know. Tom Pierce, Tom Pierce, lend me your grey mare. All along, out, along, down, along, lee. For I want to go to Witty Come Fair with Bill Brewer, Jan Stewart, Peter Kearney, Peter Davy, Patrick Moore. But it, Patrick Moore now, Patrick Moore. Where is it, Patrick? Peter Moore. Dudley Moore? Dud no. I know it's Peter Savage. <laughs> no, begin again, start again. <coughs> Bill Brewer, Jan Stewart, Peter Kearney, Peter Davy, Peter Cook. Peter Cook. No, Peter. Perhaps it isn't Peter. It's Patrick. Patrick. But oh God! Peter Gabriel, wasn't it? Uh, <laughs> was the one I? Uh, I thought it was the Archangel Gabriel, but I was <laughs> misremembered. <laughs> I was never into folk. Um, and I don't know whether you were, but was Whitcomb Fair? Was that a big thing? Was it, or was that? Would you have known well, I, that? Or? I do recognise it. Yes, I couldn't have listed the names any more than he did. I no. would have struggled to get even the first two or three, and I might have just managed um, first names. So it's an interesting hook to hang it on. But uh, so you didn't recognise that at all. No. no. Okay. Well, no, that I, falls at the first hurdle in a way. Yeah, that's why I thought I didn't know whether it was of a time sort of thing. You know, whether it was a seventies thing. You had to be there, and you had to be you know, a folky kind of person. Because I think well, they, they quite like folk music, didn't they, I think, in, in as much as they used to parody it and, and, you know, it used to play a part, didn't it? Some of their guests used to be very folky. Barbara Dixon. I'm not talking um, about ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Barbara Dixon. Um, I just wanted to prompt you to say that. Again. Or uh, or was the other one with these? Go on, do you, Tina you Charles. Charles. Wait. Was the other one, wasn't it? They used to have on all the while. She used to do Did some they? really questionable song choices. You just think, oh my word. Um, only paralleled by her wardrobe choice, but uh, <laughs> it was the well, 70s. It was the 70s, yes. What uh, were we wearing? The past was a different wardrobe. Yeah. And <laughs> best left locked. Um, so, where does that leave us? Uh, can you enjoy it on any level? I mean, presumably you worked out what the issue was, or did you just get stuck on the fact I don't recognise that song? Well, it, it wasn't so much that. It was like, I mean, I had a real, I really struggled with delineation between the sketches as well. And I, I'm thinking, is, now, is this a new sketch we've got into here? Hmm. Um, or is this still part of the old one? So my brain was kind of doing more work than it wanted to. Um, <laughs> yeah, but you're a lazy tyke. The, I am, yeah. But then, you know, rather than sitting back and enjoying it. And, th and then the next sketch really troubled me. It was, it was well, it was a poem. He read a poem, um, I've Lived and I've Loved. Oh yes, was that that seemed even drier? Well, that it? that was written by a bloke who died in eighteen eighty nine. That's why. Um, he, he was a guy called Charles McKay. Mm. Um, wrote that poem, um, and it was only because I, I recognised a line from it. And I thought, I know that. That's a famous poem. Um, and then you start to think, wonder why? What place does that have there? Um, well, obviously, it's got something to do with porridge because because of the prison warden Mackay. Oh, Mackay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> His so great when, I, when I worked at Derby, everybody used to think it was uh, he was named after their manager, Murdo Mackay. Uh, right. But uh, yeah, everybody's got their own Mackay story, haven't they? I suppose. I, I did think that only Barker, only somebody like Ronnie Barker, somebody of the stature of Ronnie Barker, somebody of the draw and the clouds of Ronnie Barker could get away with this. I couldn't see a lesser person going to the BBC or any other broadcaster with this and saying, what, what do you think? No, no, but that's isn't that showbiz? 
or, yeah, or business I guess, generally? I guess so. I mean, when you look at what who he brought with him, I mean, um, the writers on it were quite interesting, I thought. There was um, the, the, some of the, the writing credits. David Klimmy, I think it's pronounced rather than Klimmy because it's only one M. Mm. Um, who wrote the, you know, the, Derek Nimmo always appeared as a vicar. Yeah, sorry. Yes, I, I remember, remember that. <laughs> well, David Klimmy was the guy who wrote all that stuff. He wrote Oh Brother and Oh Father, and I think he wrote Series 4 of Bootsy and Snudge as well. Uh, John Graham was another writer who went on to write a sitcom called Margie and Me with, believe it or not, Arthur Mullard and Betty Marsden. Oh, um, gosh. Spike Milligan had a writing credit in there as well, didn't he? Yeah. Uh, Peter Spence, who went on to write To the Manor Born. Um, Gerald mm. Wiley, of course, who was Ronnie Barker. Yes. So you look at the writing credits there as well, and you kind of think, you know, there's a lot of, again, I mean, people who've done a bit. The, the more I think about it, and you've steered me in this direction, so thank you for clarifying it. Uh, it's it's really, it's an audio showreel, isn't it, thinking about it? it yeah. Yeah, I think sadly. But, but instead of being showreel of what you've done in the past, which uh, every uh, actor has to try and dust off and keep up to date. Um, it's it's sort of, this is my showreel in the, into the future or the kind of thing I can do in the future. Do you think he was trying to be surreal? <sighs> That's, I never find that a, a straightforward question, really. Well, I suppose we've, we've slabbed some shows which are very obviously surreal. You don't have to ask the question about, this is Ginzy, for instance, yeah. <laughs> from a few weeks back. Um, it was writ large, but... Um, yeah, I, I, I think for me it comes into the grey area where I don't really know. I can't quite decode what he's doing. But he's clearly afforded, again, well, one reason I'm calling it a Smilecom is because there's no pressure from having an audience there in real time or indeed listening back afterwards or, or any form of audience laughter in it. So mm. I think that's liberated him. But that's why I, I was thinking of it as a sort of um, using my own term, copyright lacy, and uh, used in, in to distraction and uh, overused but that's why it feels to me like a, a small com format he's he's liberated to throw in a poem from 1887 i just wonder because this was 71 mm. and anarchy had been unleashed on the comedic and the and the world of the bbc in 1969 in the form of monty python mm. Yeah. And I wonder if this is his response to Monty Python, in a way. I wonder if this is the start of him saying, well, I can, I, you know, working with Spike Milligan, I can be um, a little bit wacky and a little bit weird and a little bit out there and make people scratch their head rather than laugh. Hmm. I don't know. I ju it's, just, it's just, I'm just looking at, I was looking at what else in 71, um, what the comedic landscape was like. And you've got things like the Liver Birds, Mike Yarwood. Um, uh, Wendy Cragen and Mother Makes Three, Bless This House, The Comedians. Mm. He, of course, was doing the two Ronnies, The Benny Hill Show, The Max Bygrave Show. So it's all, you know, Dad's Army. It's all fairly uh, on the buses, please, sir. It was all the, the kind of 1970s staples of, of sitcom were there, weren't they? Maybe he, was, maybe he was kicking against that in his own way. I don't know. Well, uh, yes, but amongst other things, before we get uh, a huge post bag, which of course I will redirect to you electronically or otherwise, the two runners did only start in the same year, 1971. Right. I don't know if we know whether it was actually literally going, but obviously both would have been in the planning uh, probably the previous year at least. Um, so uh, he would have known it was coming even if it hadn't sort of, well, it wouldn't have taken off immediately perhaps. But um, but he certainly was a, it was a, he was a known quantity on TV, wasn't he, by 1966 even, thanks mm. to the Frost Report. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it's interesting putting it in historical uh, context. Uh, but the other thing, I was, I was trying to do some uh, mental arith arithmetic and uh, he, he was in his 40s by the time he was doing this. Right. Now, I guess you might say, I don't know how much this was stand-up discretionary, my gut feeling is... Uh, careers took off a little later in those days compared to these days. Mm. Does, does that sound fair, plausible? Yeah, yeah I think so, yeah. Mm. And because um, I do remember Ronnie Corbett saying, uh, you know, he nurtured and valued his success all the more because he'd s striven for it uh, for, for longer. It was a slower build. Mm. Um, so that's another factor. He's got to think, right, well, 
you know, no one's got uh, an indefinite um, uh, ca career path as a comedian, of all things. I mean, coming back to Morecambe and Wise, at one point, Eric Morecambe, at the height of their fame, said he thought they only had another 18 months in them. Right. Um, but but that's that just general nervousness, isn't it, that you that you can't help it, showbiz? No. I mean, may maybe this they were also... I just noticed as well, one thing that caught my eye is that also in 71, uh, Ronnie Corbett did a, a one-off... Um, sketch show called Ronnie Corbett in bed and it, mm. lit it literally did one episode um, and it said it was a comedy special aired as a prelude to the two Ronnie starring Ronnie Corbett and Ronnie Barker uh, who was a, a special guest mm -hmm. so who knows what was going on at that stage it's quite an interesting time for the two of them isn't it really the, also he did mm. the Ronnie Barker yearbook in 71 as well so th they were often in side projects weren't they as well as the because you know, not really sure how the two Ronnies was going to, or whether the two Ronnies were going to take off at all. No, there, there are, there's no such thing as an absolute dead cert. You can have certain hunches, and obviously if you put bigger names together, uh, that can help with the initial profile. But mm. if, if the public don't like it, the public don't like it. No. And, uh, um, can't flog a dead horse forever. But I do remember them saying about um, the, the two Ronnies that it, it, it worked for them keeping side projects going because it was only about 16 weeks of the of the year it took up. And I also remember around that time, um, my, my sister being a bit older and she had a friend who went to see Ronnie Corbett at the end of the pier and uh, would have been around that time. Um, and, of course, he could have his summer season because that wouldn't clash with the two Ronnies. So what we thought of as, you know, their main body of work was actually in practice about a quarter of the year. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? You, 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 you know, you're trying to piece together what was happening behind the scenes from, from looking at what's been put out there, and it's not always easy and, and possible to do, is it? No. I thought the mu the music was a little bit kind of manic as well. There were like bits of music, you know, like the, the theme intro music and that was all a bit. Um, and I'm sure that guitarist, there was a guitarist in there, and I'm sure his name was Dick Abel, not Dick Abel, as they kept pronouncing it. Right. <laughs> that, I'm guessing, might have been a joke then. Well, no, that was but his real name. His, his real name is Dick Abel, but, I mean, they kept pronouncing it Dick Abel. Well, I had a metalwork teacher whose name was Dick Cable. But um, just throwing that in. Yeah, well, I had, a, I had a, an RE teacher called Mrs. Onions, and she swore blind it was Miss O'Nions. <laughs> she did, honestly. It's the old St. Ockwell and Clam for Stockwell and Clapham, Is this... at the height of the property boom in London. <laughs> I've not heard that one. <laughs> yeah, I didn't, I didn't fall for that. I like that, I like that, yeah. I was too busy on the Clapham omnibus with all the other ordinary people. Ordinary people, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, I think it's time to reach a conclusion. I call this uh, meeting to order, and who wants to go first? Halt there. Who who goes there first? Um, he, who, he, he, who he who goes oh. first goes last. No, that's not right. <laughs> he who laughs last is slow to see the joke. I think Dicker Bell should go first, but there you go. <laughs> All right, then, well, don't don't dick about Dicker Bell. Come on, pack it in. <laughs> dicker dum, dicker dum. Well, that was another song. The other thing was then, every time they mentioned it, or they mentioned it at the end, and all I could think of was Dicker Bell, Dicker Bell, Dicker Bell, 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 Dicker Bell, Dicker Bell, Dicker Bell, which wasn't right at all, was it really? So No, that was William Kiss and Tell Overture. Do you want me to Do you want me to go first? Because mine's not going to take long. It won't take up much space. Uh, yeah, except now I want to anticipate it, but that does take up space. Oh, anyway, no, yeah, well, give, us, give us... You go some. first if you want, then, Hugo. No, 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 I was going to try and guess. Um, from from your headline, I'm guessing we're we're in the two out of five uh, ballpark, aren't we? Bang on, bang on. Yes! Back of the net, kiss my goal. <laughs> kiss my chuddies. Yeah. Um, right, well, uh, at least it wasn't one and a half or even one. No, I think you'll your... give it three and a half. Yeah, you're wrong. That is the Lacey Norm, but I can't be quite that generous. I'm giving it three because I think the production values are pretty good. I, I loved hearing tape hiss, didn't you? It made me yes. so nostalgic yeah. being an old boy. Yeah. Um, yeah. Look it up, folks, on Google if you don't know what tape hiss is. Uh, so uh, with uh, talking of maths again, that uh, is a five out of ten, which I make 50%. Mm. Uh, just as it's half a century old, it's half marks for Ronnie Barker's lines from my grandfather's forehead. History will decide whether we've been kind. You know, when we get to the centenary, well, maybe you and I won't make it, but when they uh, 
look back a uh, hundred years from 1971, uh, they they might uh, you know might have a revival in retrospect. I'll be lucky if I make it. If they look back next week, to be honest, with you, but, uh, <laughs> the way you're going, but yeah, the way I'm going, I'll tell you. Uh, so well, for homework for next week, then I've got one for you. I've if you one. do last the week, yes, we should at least think positively. Here's one banged up to date as well. Um, mm. It's one that I came across when I was um, just perusing the internet and seeing what the, the latest things were being commissioned and what had been made and what had made it to the screen and all the rest of it. And I came across an innocuous-looking sitcom about a working-class family. Um, but then what attracted my attention was who had written it and who was starring in it, um, mm. the same person. Um, and I first came across this guy... I don't know if you remember him. Um, he was he appeared in a couple of episodes at least. It might be one episode, might have been two, I can't remember, of Extras with Ricky mm-hmm. Gervais. And I don't know if you know Extras that well, but he went through a phrase, a phase where Ricky Gervais realised that he hadn't got any friends. Mm. And so he makes friends with this guy, I think, who just randomly talks to him. They're both sat at a table on their own in a restaurant, I think. And he foolishly invites this guy over, this Welsh guy, and he can't get rid of him. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, hilarity ensues, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> the guy is, uh, you might not even know him, the guy's called Steve Spears. And mm. he's a big, heavy set Welsh fella. Mm. Um, and I, I would watch him read the phone book, to be honest with you. Um, He's he's appeared in Afterlife as well, so he's he's obviously done stuff other stuff with uh, Ricky Gervais. He was in Inside Number Nine. He was in um, a radio series called Ankle Tag. He appeared in Upstart Crow. I mean, he's he, oh, I've I've heard uh, Ankle Tag. You might you might you know you'd, you'd know him. I mean, I think he's I think he's a contemporary of Rob Brydon's. Um, right. But he's he's been in all all kinds of all kinds of stuff, um, which I'm sure we'll talk about next week. Anyway, the program is called The Tuckers. Carefully, you say that. Yes, the Tuckers, and uh, it's the first series, and it's episode one that I've gone for. So, uh, series one, episode one, the Tuckers, uh, starring and written by Steve Spears. Okay, and I've just summoned up his uh, visage, so I know um, who we're talking about. And uh, yes, he is in a lot of things. Um, there's a lot of quality actors that you go, oh, yeah, he was in such and such. I'm turning into my dad, of course, as is inevitable. Uh, right, I will look forward to tucking into that, as I'm sure oh. uh, <laughs> yeah. our listeners will too. Yeah, it's good. Uh, keep it in. It didn't get a laugh. So on to antisocial media. On Twitter, we are at Comedy Slab. Not altogether surprisingly. Glad we nabbed that handle early on. Well done, sir. And uh, at Comedy Slab is also, by strange coincidence, the handle of our Facebook page. So if you could like that and uh, follow us on Twitter, uh, we, of course, would like you to. Do pass on our, I nearly said, pass on our good wishes to all our friends. But, you know, you'll make real friends with people uh, uh, once they realise how much they enjoy the Comedy Slab, as, of course, do you. So uh, pass the word around. Uh, whether it be uh, friends and indeed family or workmates, uh, whoever it is. And lastly, a nice uh, juicy star rating on uh, Apple, iTunes, Stroke Podcast, whatever it is, uh, and a little bit of a, a, a crit, hopefully a flattering one to go with it, a little bit of writing as well. Um, thank you in advance for that. Bless you. And as you probably know by now, we're on Spreaker, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, uh, Apple Podcasts, and many, many more, as they used to say. <laughs> On uh, on KTEL, and as Adrian said a little bit earlier on, if you if you have a thought about comedy or you think oh that'd be a good one to chuck on the slab, many people do. Give us a shout. We always like to try out your suggestions, so uh, it'd be great if you can. Really appreciate that. Yes, I think we should put an illegal disclaimer at third of uh, three three times as fast as everything else. Um, we offer the result blind. There's no guarantee that we'll absolutely put it on the comedy slab or indeed like it. Um, other other slabs are not available. Um, right. So, shall we leave it there in a sort of hanging surreally in the air? Well, I was only going to say that you've been listening to The Comedy Slab, written and conceived by Shane O'Connor and Adrian Lacey, with additional material by Dickabell. <laughs> <laughs> That's easy for you to say. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>